Parkland, Florida, putting lawmakers on notice as they speak out in the state capitol demanding change on gun control. Hello, everyone. I'm Dana Perino, and this is The Daily Briefing. Survivors of the Parkland shooting meeting face-to-face -face with Florida lawmakers a week after one of their former classmates used a semi-automatic rifle to kill 17 people at their school. If we had stricter gun control measures in Florida, 17 families would be having dinner tonight together instead of a mourning for the loss of their loved ones. We will not be discouraged. We will not falter. We will not stop this movement. Please, I beg and I demand that every single person in power who has the ability to change the fear that kids feel going back to school that they do something. Rich Edson is reporting live from Tallahassee. Rich, there's also a rally supporting these students' efforts. Yeah, that's right, Dana. While those students lobbied and spoke inside the state capitol, outside here, there was a massive rally that has just broken up, and organizers dispersed the crowd here by giving directions to Governor Rick Scott's office. That's where a number of these protesters and demonstrators are now headed. Uh, local high school students, others from Florida State, Florida A&M, teachers, parents, gun control advocates, swamped this lawn just a short while ago. They started gathering here late in the morning, spoke early through the afternoon, now, behind this building, this is the old Florida State House, is the newer Florida State House. That's where the legislative uh, efforts and action happened in the Florida Capitol. That's where students from Stoneman Douglas High School were lobbying their state government. They say they're pushing for stronger gun control as a major piece of what they're calling student safety. And they say they fear they might be a little disappointed in, in uh, what will come out of today's efforts. The law has failed us and let and has let the events that happened in Parkland to occur. And what we must do now is enact change, because that is what we do to things that fail. We change them. To not change the law in our time, change them. To not change the law in our time of need would be a huge disservice to the 17 dead in Parkland, the 13 dead in Columbine, the 26 dead in Sandy Hook, the 50 dead in Orlando, the 59 dead in Las Vegas, now, before three busloads of students got here at Stoneman Douglas High School, uh, there were a number of folks from the local university, students from the local high school mm -hmm. here in support. And there are also rallies around the country, walkouts around the country from students and across the state. Dana. And Rich, how is the Florida legislature responding to them today? Well, before those students arrived yesterday, the Florida State House failed to prove or pass a, mess, uh, a measure that would have allowed the House uh, legislature to move on to a, a, an assault rifle ban. Uh, the Senate's president tells us they still plan to work on a few gun-related items, uh, measures that prevent those younger than 21 from buying an assault rifle, uh, some more money for mental health, some more money for student safety. Uh, but the Florida legislature has a pretty compressed timeline here, Dana. Their annual session ends in about two weeks. They could come back in a special session, but they're not scheduled to right now, and they're not scheduled to meet after this session until next year. Dana? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we'll see if that changes. Rich Edson, thank you. Passionate survivors calling for action with protests underway outside the White House as President Trump gets ready to meet students, parents, and teachers with direct experience of these horrific tragedies. Chief White House correspondent John Roberts is live on the North Lawn. John, the president is expected to hear these stories firsthand from people who were affected by the Florida shooting and possibly other shootings throughout the country. You know, we saw the compelling statements from the students there in Tallahassee at the uh, Florida legislature, and the president is going to hear a lot of that today. 4.15 in the state dining room, which will hold a significant number of people, the president will be engaging with students, parents, and teachers. Among the people who will be there, we're told 15 to 20 students, parents, and teachers of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas School, where that horrific shooting was last week. There will also be uh, people who are representing uh, Sandy Hook Promise, that's uh, family members of uh, some of the victims of the Sandy Hook school shooting in Connecticut as well. Uh, people from Rachel's Challenge, which is an organization dedicated to reducing school violence and uh, other uh, parents, teachers and school students from the local area here in D.C. who have all had some sort of experience with school violence will all be here. Now, the president yesterday did take some steps to move forward to it's not really on gun control. It's on accessory control. 
those uh, bump stocks, as they're called, or slide fire mechanisms that allowed the shooter in Las Vegas to take so many lives on October the 1st last year. Now uh, the target of the president, who sent a memorandum to Jeff Sessions, the uh, attorney general, to see if he could ban bump stocks. Listen to what the president said about that yesterday. The key in all of these efforts, as I said in my remarks the day after the shooting, is that we cannot merely take actions that make us feel like we are making a difference. We must actually make a difference. The president is also weighing a number of different options, and he'll likely hear some of that today from the parents, students, and teachers who are in attendance. Uh, one of the considerations might be to raise the minimum age at which you can purchase a firearm. Federally, it's t age 21 for a handgun and 18 for a long gun, which would be a rifle or a shotgun, including those assault-style weapons. The president entertained maybe moving that up to 21. Uh, might not be able to be done at the federal level, though, because that, that uh, d devolves uh, a lot to states. So the president may just be in a position of advocacy. He'll also talk about the mental health issue associated with these deranged shooters who go in there and kill so many people, and as well, support for tightening up the background checks. It's mm -hmm. the Corn and Murphy bill, which really, Dana, just compels state and local, state, local, and federal agencies to do what they're supposed to do, and that's report information up to the next database. So mm -hmm. it, it, you can't see how that's really moving the ball forward as mm -hmm. much as it is just trying to tighten up existing law. Well, I think the issue on that is that the conservatives in the House have wanted to t attach the concealed carry reciprocity yeah. bill to that corn and background bill, and they didn't want it to be decoupled because they didn't want to like mm -hmm. miss this opportunity. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, meanwhile, there is continuing fallout from the Rob Porter scandal that now may affect Jared Kushner. Do you have an update on that? Well, you remember uh, last Friday, uh, Chief of Staff John Kelly issued that memorandum saying that he would, by this Friday, revoke the interim security clearance of anybody whose security clearance has been pending since June 1st or earlier. That apparently, at least at the present time, does not affect uh, Jared Kushner, who has access to some of the highest level classified information, including the president's daily brief, which is only seen by a handful of people. Uh, it may be because his security clearance was not completed uh, until after June the 1st. He had to go back and revise his SF-86 form, and Dana, you're familiar with that. Uh, a couple of times to include some contacts with foreign officials that he hadn't previously listed. But here's what the Chief of Staff, John Kelly, said about Jared Kushner. As I told Jared days ago, I have full confidence in his ability to continue performing his duties in his foreign policy portfolio, including overseeing our Israeli-Palestinian peace effort and serving as an integral part of our relationship with Mexico. Everyone in the White House is grateful for these valuable contributions to furthering the President's agenda. There is no truth to any suggestion otherwise. Sarah Sanders, in the briefing yesterday, went even further to say nothing that has taken place will affect the valuable work that Jared is doing. Now don't forget though that when he issued that memo last Friday, John Kelly said that he would review this on a month-to-month -month basis. So depending on when Kushner's final security clearance, his FS, SF-86, was uh, finally submitted, uh, he may at some point uh, come into the crosshairs in that edict. But maybe he'll have his full security clearance before that. Dana? And John, there's no White House briefing today. Why is that? Uh, because they, they want the focus to be on the president's uh, uh, listening session, this roundtable this afternoon. Uh, I know that as a former press secretary, you believe that there should be a, a briefing almost every day unless the president's traveling or, or he's speaking himself to the press. Mm -hmm. But uh, this White House operates a little differently than All the right. one that you were involved in. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going to see you on the five when you give us an update. So we'll talk to you then. All Thank right. you. Thanks, Dana. Bye. For more on the gun control debate, let's bring in Michael Starr Hopkins. He's a Democratic strategist and contributor to The Hill. Alex Conant is a former communications director for Senator Marco Rubio and a partner at Firehouse Strategies. I wanted to bring up a poll that Quinnipiac has just put out on gun control. This is pretty interesting. And Alex, I'll start with you. Um, the first question was, do you support or oppose stricter gun laws in the United States? That support number now at 66%. And the other one is, do you support or oppose a nationwide ban on the sale of assault weapons? Up to 67 percent, possibly one of the highest that we've ever seen on that. Given those numbers and the, the trend increasingly ticking upwards for people who want more gun control, is it becoming untenable for lawmakers in either state houses or Congress to not do anything? Uh, the short answer is no. I mean, I don't think that we should make public policy based on what the polls say, especially after 
any certain incident. I think we should make policy based on what's the best policy here. And simply banning certain, certain types of weapons won't eliminate the sort of mass shootings that we've seen in recent weeks. We do need to do things to reduce the number of mass shootings we're seeing in this country. And I think the things that the president is talking about, possibly raising the age uh, limit for where, when you can buy rifles, mm -hmm. uh, more background checks, strengthening the background check system, keeping guns out of the hands of the mentally ill, those are the things that we can focus on. And those are the things that have a strong bipartisan support. Michael, um, if the president is l allowing the door ajar, <laughs> will the Democrats be willing to sort of meet him there and, and push on the open door and try to get something done with him, at least on these things, even if it's not everything that the Democrats would want? Absolutely. I think the president's in a unique perspective as a Republican uh, and being able to talk about eliminating some of our issues with guns, he can speak to that in a way that Democrats can. And while we'll never eliminate all mm -hmm. uh, gun deaths, all gun violence deaths, we can certainly reduce them. You know, we had the Tommy gun in the 1920s, 1930s, and we eliminated that. We've had mm -hmm. an assault weapons ban before, and the mm -hmm. courts have found that that's constitutional. We can do well, something Well, they found about that it's this. constitutional, but I think that the finding was that it wasn't actually having an impact. So I think that's another question. Alex, I'll ask you, the, what do you think the impact of this, the passion that the students are bringing? And as John Roberts says, it is compelling. They are impressive young people. But can they channel that passion into driving good public policy? Well, that's a great question. It, look, it's going to take a long, sustained effort. In the past, when we've seen mass shootings, we've seen focus on the issue for a couple of days, maybe a week or two, but then the people move on. The American people's, our, our attention span, unfortunately, just isn't that long. And so people move on. And this is going to take a long time to work its way through Congress. As you pointed out in, with John, there's already controversy surrounding what would seemingly be a simple bipartisan proposal. Uh, and so it's going to require presidential leadership. It's going to require time from lawmakers. And so the rallies today, while they, they're, they're the reason we're talking about gun control right mm -hmm. now, they need to keep that up for weeks, months to come if they want to actually see some action. Which is something I actually think these kids can do. They understand social media in a way that right. most of us don't. And they're not disillusioned with politics the way that many of us are. This is, you know, they're survivors of these incidents. And I think they actually will be able to sustain it and put pressure on Democrats and Republicans. They certainly have the power to convene in both online and then obviously in these uh, rallies that they're having in Florida. It's an impressive number of people that they've uh, brought there. And unfortunately for them, though, social media comes with bad actors as well, including ridiculous conspiracy theories that um, these children who experienced the shooting are actually child actors. And mm -hmm. I think that hopefully we have put that to bed and will not allow that happen again. Absolutely. All right. Absolutely. Thanks to you. Thank you, Michael Starr Hopkins and Thank Alex you. Conant. Appreciate it. Thanks, Anna. And I think that we have to be right back. We're mourning the loss of America's pastor today, as we learn that Reverend Billy Graham has died at the age of 99. He delivered the message of the November of 2013. I sat down and talked with Joel Osteen, one of the most popular preachers of our time, about Billy Graham. Take a look. As a young evangelist, what did it mean to you the first time that you met Billy Graham? Well, Chris, it was like meeting Moses or Abraham. I'll never forget it one on one. We walked in the room of his house. He was so kind to invite us. Said, it's really like a log cabin. And my wife started crying, which made me start weeping as well because we didn't let him see that. But it was just very, very moving. You know, he came walking in. He was very frail. It's about six, seven, eight years ago. But when he sat down and we talked, he's the most gentle, kind man, so respectful. I asked him for advice. What would he, you know, have? You know, what could he encourage me to do? He's just so humble. He said, "How could I tell you anything, Joel? Look at those big crowds you speak to." He was always turning the attention away from himself onto others. Such an encouragement, and you know, growing up in a preacher's home, he was always a hero to me. And so walking in that day was like, you know, I couldn't have met anybody that I'd rather met in the whole world. I can remember as a kid watching on black and white TV, it'd be Yankee Stadium, a uh, hundred thousand people there and he would call them to come forward what was his message what was his appeal well I think Dr. Graham's main appeal was salvation and repentance and Christ has forgiven you of your sins will you make a decision for that I think on a personal level he had a he had a conviction and he had that charisma and there was something about him and his accent he was you could tell he believed what he was saying and something that just drew you in 
And of course, you know, it, it's, it's God on the inside of him drawing people. As I said, we talked with Joel Osteen back in 2013 when Billy Graham was quite ill and frankly we were preparing for his passing. But Dr. Graham lived on until today, age 99. As Joel Osteen said then, Billy Graham finished strong. Dana? All right, Chris Wallace, thanks for bringing that to us today because a lot of people in America were, were certainly touched by him and uh, will certainly um, join it together in uh, hoping that the Lord gives him peace in heaven, as he always said that that was going to be his home. I know that several presidents have already put out statements, um, but they're not the only ones. People all over the world really appreciated what Billy Graham meant to them. So thank you he, for bringing that to us. He, he and his wife, Ruth, beloved wife Ruth, are in heaven together right now. Indeed. All right, Chris Wallace, thank you. You bet. President Trump is set to address the CPAC conference on Friday. We'll speak to the organizer, Matt Schlapp about some of the controversy at this year's event and more. CPAC conference getting underway in Maryland today. President Trump among many conservatives who will take the stage over the next four days. We now bring in the organizer of the conference, Matt Schlapp, chairman of the American Conservative Union. It's great to have you here. Matt, I don't think of you as a very controversial guy, but every year CPAC seems to uh. draw some controversy. Uh, last night there was this question about whether uh, Dinesh D'Souza would be speaking uh, because of a picture in the yes. program. Uh, he tweeted last night about the students reacting to the assault weapons ban. Worst news since the their parents told them to get summer jobs. He then apologized later on, saying, while it aimed at media manipulation, my tweet was insensitive to students who lost friends in a terrible tragedy. I'm truly sorry. Uh, just to clarify, he's not speaking today? No, and he was never going to be part of the program. So this is one of these unfortunate things that happens on social media, Dana, where it just gets going. And sometimes yeah. it's our enemies that are trying to pick at us, pick at, pick at the flaws, and, mm -hmm. and they run with it. But that, it, it's surprising to us because we see these things. And Dinesh D'Souza wasn't, uh, wasn't ever on the agenda this year. I, by the way, I'm glad he apologized yeah. because um, uh, no, I, c I can't imagine he meant that with that tweet. And as you always say, you're never getting in trouble for the tweet you do not send. That's right. That's a book I want to write, tweets I never sent. Um, Wayne LaPierre, <laughs> right. the head of the NRA, is he going to be speaking today in the, uh, on a day where these students are having uh, the, the rallies in the press conference that they have in Florida really demanding that lawmakers finally do something uh, we don't know what that something would be on gun control yeah look I know that this is a tough and a raw and emotional moment especially for these victims uh, their families um, and uh, and I think uh, but it would be a mistake for CPAC to back away from having the appropriate conversations around the Second Amendment, violence in society, and what's happening in our communities. I mean, there's a real problem out there in America, and we need to talk about it. I think mm -hmm. it's a big mistake to step away from the topics that are causing us trouble in society. We need to step into them. We need to try to resolve them. Wayne LaPierre mm -hmm. will, will be speaking. He's my friend. He's a leader in this area, and I'm glad he's going to be here. He'll be there. Um I wanted to ask you what you think the mission of CPAC is today, and has it changed at all since President Trump was elected president? The other controversy was about Marianne Le Pen coming to speak. She is from uh, yes. the, the, she's from, well, I guess it's, whether she's part of uh, her uh, grandfather's party or not, but it almost seems like American conservatism is on this march to match up with far-right politics of Europe. And CPAC has always been, I guess some people think it's a place for a lot of diversity of thought. I just wonder what you think about the yeah. con controversy surrounding this idea. It, it, I don't think, it's, I think it's meant to be your thing. This is the American Conservative Union. It doesn't have to be all things to all conservatives. That, that's right, but you know me and uh, people who see me on your show. I'm a conservative. Uh, I'm not a far-right person. I'm not somebody who's anti-immigrant. Uh, I'm not someone who denies the Holocaust. And I think what's interesting is people are trying to attack this young woman, Marion Le Pen, whose grandfather uh, was an infamous political figure in France and who had some ab abhorrent positions. She's her own person. She's a young person. She has broken with her family uh, on those positions. And she is a new voice in France. And by the way, she's a voice that resembles a lot of uh, conservative voices here. She's for traditional marriage. She's pro-life. She doesn't believe that the welfare state solves problems. And yes, she wants to make sure when people come uh, immigrate into France that they want to be friends.
French and they want to mm -hmm. love the country. Uh, these are themes that we can understand in this country. But I think you're right. Look, we're going to give her a, a chance to address our attendees and the people who watch uh, on online and on, on television. And uh, I, I believe in letting people speak and give their point of view. I think we will all be enriched. And I think a lot of people are going to have to take back their attacks when they hear after they hear her talk. Well, I know that putting together CPAC is a ton of work, so I wish you the best of luck over the next few days. And uh, congratulations to your niece, who I saw got married over the weekend. Match lap, everybody. Oh, thank you very American much, American Conservative Dana. Union. Bye-bye. All right, the stakes are high for the 2018 midterms, and we are debuting Fox News' brand-new power rankings. I'm going to tell you about the most competitive races across the country right now. But Senator Pat Toomey blasting his state's new congressional map amid charges that the new map is just as partisan as the old one. A whole lot at stake in the 2018 midterms with the entire House, a third of the Senate and 36 governorships all up for grabs this November. Peter Ducey is live in Washington. Peter, where do Republicans have the biggest advantage? The Senate, Dana, and that's according to Democrats that I've spoken to who admit that the Senate map is going to make it tough for them to wrestle control of the upper chamber away from the GOP. And here is why. They've got to defend four times as many seats as Republicans, just eight Republican seats up this year compared to 26 Democrats or the independents who sit with them. And 10 of those Democrats are trying to win in states that President Trump carried two years ago. This morning, we did publish new Fox News power rankings that look at the closest contests, and they find two upcoming races now leaning Republican, Indiana and Tennessee. Four more Senate races are leading Democratic. That's Ohio, Pennsylvania, Montana, and Nevada. And then there are the toss-ups, Arizona, Florida, Missouri, North Dakota, and West Virginia. When it comes to gubernatorial races, Republicans are on defense. They've got 33 total seats right now compared to 16 for the Democrats, but the Democrats are thought to have an advantage in most of November's 21 gubernatorial races. Dana. And Peter, what do you know about the Democratic plan to try and win back the House? The plan, Dana, is just to try to tie everything to Trump. Democrats have not yet come up with a unifying message. Uh, what are they going to say to the American people other than we don't like Trump? Unfortunately for Republicans, that might be enough, because if you look at his historically bad approval ratings again, that might be enough. Republicans think they can play that game, too, though, as there is a Democrat that they are going to campaign to keep in the minority. The most well-worn foil in town is Nancy Pelosi, and I think that the former speaker, now minority leader of the House, has once again found herself at the top of the heap in terms of Republican boogeymen. This is somebody who every Republican, I think, in the country at some point will talk about Nancy Pelosi and what she would do if she got her hands on the speaker's gavel. In the House, where Democrats need to flip 24 seats to win, Democratic operatives are telling me they're optimistic about their chances because they've had success in some down-ballot special elections since the tax bill passed. But that's the same tax bill that Republicans think is their biggest advantage. Dana. I'm excited, Peter, about these Fox News power rankings, and I hope to have you back often to talk about them. Thank you. Thank you. The new Pennsylvania congressional map is stirring up controversy with charges that it's nearly as partisan as the old one. And the Republican senator from Pennsylvania, Pat Toomey, he's looking to take action, saying, quote, look, I think it's inevitable that the conversation is going to take place. The fundamental question is, does this blatant, unconstitutional partisan power grab that undermines our electoral process, does that rise to the level of impeachment. Joining me now, Josh Kroshar, politics editor at the National Journal. You wrote about this yesterday. What's your take on this new map? Look, Dana, it's almost impossible to take politics out of redistricting. And Democrats are right, because the map that Republicans drew in 2011 is a pretty gerrymandered, uncompetitive map that, that benefits the Republican Party. But when you look at the process by which Democrats redrew drew the map, it's, it's filled with partisan politics. The Democrats won a, in the Supreme Court in Pennsylvania, you're elected by party. Democrats mm -hmm. won a state Supreme Court majority. They got partisan control. They had this ruling that came down the pike about a month ago, mm -hmm. and they decided to throw out the maps, write their, draw their own maps, and all the big decisions, when you look at the congressional district lines in this new map, s favor Democrats. Democrats. It gives them an advantage in all these subtle ways that, that, that could have a big impact in who takes the majority in the House next year. Do the Republicans have any standing to get this changed, or are we sort of running out of time? And there's some they're very limited uh, legal appeals. I, they're 
promising they're going to try to do uh, an overturning of this map in the court. But this was a state Supreme Court decision, and, and the U.S. Supreme Court doesn't really have jurisdiction over the state Supreme Court's decision. So in all likelihood, we're going to be looking at this new map, and Democrats could gain as many as four or five seats uh, on these new congressional district lines. Does this affect the Connor Lamb, Rick Saccone race in Pennsylvania that we're looking at, the special on March 13th? quite a bit because the district that the Democrat Connor Lamb is running in is not the same district that he, he said he's going to run in uh, under these new congressional lines. Now if Connor Lamb who's, who's this big recruit for the Democrats if he if he wins in this upcoming election in March he's probably going to have a lot of momentum he'll get a big boost when he runs for, hmm. for a new district but ultimately he's running for a district that may not exist in, in right. a few months. That's very interesting. Let me ask you about the Quinnipiac poll on the generic ballot. It had been looking much better for Republicans and then this just in today day. Uh, which party would you want to see win control of the House? Democrats at 53 percent, Republicans at 38. Uh, and among independent voters, which party would they want? Uh, Republicans at 36 and Democrats at 47. So you see that um, widening a bit. Is that consistent with what you're hearing? Well, look, you can live and die by the generic ballot, and it bounces around all, all the time. I think there are two fundamental points that both parties are, are looking at. Number one, tax reform has given a momentum boost to the Republican Definitely. Party. And if you look at all the polls, uh, Republicans have gained to several points on that generic ballot. Mm -hmm. They've seen polls in these individual races, these districts that are showing them with a little bit of momentum. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, on the other hand, there's still a lot of time left before the election. And the news of the past week, the, the tragic shooting yeah. at, in, in Florida, I mean, dem gun control is now the issue of the day and that's an issue that, that well let me ask you about Democrats. that because um the, the students down in florida they're still uh holding their rallies today um trying to make a big impact and i do think that with i talked about in the a block you know the quinnipiac poll also showed that there's an increase in the majority of people who want lawmakers to do something on gun control um how does that play in terms of politics so Republicans have always had this political advantage when it comes to gun control, because even if the polls show there's an even divide between whether people want more regulations, whether people don't want more regulations, the intensity advantage is on the Republican side. If you're an NRA member, you're going to vote all the time. You're going to go to the polls to support the candidate who expresses your, your values. What Democrats are trying to do, what these student activists are trying to do, is raise that intensity level mm -hmm. on, on the liberal side. And it was really interesting to watch some of the student advocates, uh, activists rather, who were making their points, they weren't trying to find common ground with Republicans. They were attacking Republicans. They're mm -hmm. trying to get their base uh, mobilized, mm -hmm. and they're not trying to win over folks in the middle. They're trying to really uh, energize the Democratic Party voters to be more aware and to show up at the polls on an issue of gun control. All right, Josh Crosshart, I'm glad that you were here today to explain all of that to us. Appreciate it. Thanks, Dana. There's new developments in the case of two Trump campaign aides charged in the Mueller probe. We're going to bring you the latest. Plus, the Me Too movement comes to the NBA. The bombshell report accusing one team of covering up years of sexual harassment in the front office. Shepard Smith on the Fox News deck. Much more ahead on the student-led push for stronger gun laws. And President Trump saying he could be open to some changes. But how much power does the president have when it comes to gun laws? And what about the politics involved on a controversial topic that riles up folks on both sides of the political aisle? We'll get into all of it. Top of the hour, Shepard Smith reporting. We'll see you then. Dallas Mavericks owner Mark Cuban is vowing to change the culture of the front office following a report that described a work environment as hostile to women. A former team president is accused of making sexually suggestive remarks towards several women. The report also detailed domestic assault accusations against team website reporter Earl Sneed. The Mavericks say both Sneed and Human Resources Director Buddy Pittman have been fired. The team has hired outside counsel to conduct an independent investigation. New charges today against former Trump associates Paul Manafort and Rick Gates in the special counsel investigation into Russian meddling in the 2016 election, but the documents are sealed, so we don't know what's in them. Meanwhile, the president questioning why Mueller's team isn't looking at the Obama White House, tweeting, if all of the Russian meddling took place during the Obama administration right up to January 20th, why aren't they the subject of the investigation? Why didn't Obama do something about the meddling? Why aren't Dem crimes under investigation? Ask Jeff Sessions. Well, Michael Moore is the U.S. Attorney for the Middle District of Georgia under President Obama, and Thomas Dupre, former Deputy Assistant Attorney General under President George W. Bush. Good to have you both here. Tom, let me start with you. It is difficult for the Attorney General to actually respond to the President, given that he is recused from that very case. Your thoughts? 
Dana, you're absolutely right. Look, that is what is known as a rhetorical question. President Trump knows exactly that Jeff Sessions cannot answer the question if it were posed to him, why isn't Mueller looking at this? I think that this is just the latest piece of evidence showing that President Trump's ire over Sessions' decision to recuse himself is not going anywhere. Mm -hmm. I think they are going to be living with this throughout the administration. Needless to say, it is highly unusual to have a president publicly criticizing mm -hmm. his attorney general in this way. But I think this just underscores the president president's sense of frustration that through the recusal, the executive branch and the president in particular has essentially lost control over the direction of this investigation. Michael, what are your thoughts about it? Because not only is it unusual, but some people think it's highly inappropriate. Well, I, I think it's probably evidence that the president's becoming unhinged. And what we see over the last few days, we see the indictments that came down against the 13 Russians. We see now what appears to be a superseding indictment in the case of Manafort and Gates. We're learning about other cooperators. We're learning about people in the indictments who are listed as known and unknown to the grand jury. And I really think that what you're starting to see is the pressure around this president, the pressure around the administration, uh, start, to, start to push the, the president mm -hmm. to react. And mm -hmm. that's what he's doing. I mean, he shouldn't, there's no question that the White House should not be controlling this investigation. Right. And the idea that he somehow pushes back on the attorney general uh, is, is a dangerous thing. And, and frankly, I think it would likely set a precedent if he wants to talk about, if Trump wants to talk about yeah, investigating the president, that's, I think it's something I think he the, that's exactly right. Certainly right. the Democrats think about that when they look at all the judges that the Republicans are able to confirm with just 51 votes after Harry Reid uh, used the nuclear option right. back in the Obama administration. There was one other thing I wanted to ask you about. So there's been this increasing calls and stories that I don't even know if they're actually right about Michael Flynn and whether he should withdraw his plea agreement. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Renato Mariotti, uh, somebody I follow on Twitter, he's running for Attorney General of Illinois. He tweeted this. If Flynn was permitted, oh, I'm sorry, he writes this one. I'll choose, he wrote a lot today. So it's unclear to me why it would be in Flynn's interest to withdraw his guilty plea, even if he could. He is represented by a very prestigious, well-regarded law firm that obtained a deal for him that is unlikely to result in a significant prison sentence. And even if he could withdraw his plea, it is quite difficult to do so, right, Tom? It is, Dana. It is very difficult to do so. And look, my take on this is Flynn got an excellent deal from Bob Mueller. And if he were to try to blow that up, essentially saying, I am ready to go to trial on these charges, that would be an immense roll of the dice. Honestly, there's possibility that Mueller could add additional charges. If Flynn were to gamble and lose, he could be facing, you know, four, five, ten times the amount of jail mm -hmm. time that he could face under a plea deal. So I would be extremely cautious about pulling back this plea, at least until you've seen seen the evidence that Mueller now is going to apparently mm -hmm. put in in response to the court's demand that Mueller give him some evidence. But unless there's some sort of smoking gun bombshell in there, I can't see why it would be rational for Flynn to pull back this favorable deal he's obtained. Michael, this request for evidence, isn't that standard operating procedure in a case, not something unusual or should suggest that there's right. anything improper that's happened? I don't think there's anything to read improper in it. This is not unusual for a judge to have a standing order that tells the prosecutors, yes, these are things that you have to give over. The law already imposes that duty uh, that you would give certain uh, exculpatory things to a defendant. Um, so I don't think there's anything to read into it. And I think actually this judge said it's a, it's, it's a standing order. What you've got to remember is that with the withdrawal of a guilty plea is not a matter of right. Once the judge accepts the plea, and uh, has had a chance to look at the plea agreement and says, mm -hmm. I'll, I'll take the plea, then the defendant, this being Mike Flynn, would bear the burden of coming in and saying that there was some substantial reason or manifest injustice of why he should be allowed to withdraw it. And or that I he think, was coerced uh, my colleague's into, right. And, or that he that's, was coerced into it somehow. Well, I guess that's right. that would be and a claim. I, <laughs> Well, I think it could be a claim, but I think that my, my colleague here with me is right in that mm -hmm. he may be uh, uh, opening a can of worms he doesn't want to open. He may, mm -hmm. in fact, have a, have a chance to make an argument that he should withdraw it. The question is, does he want to, given the deal that he got? I mean, it, yeah. Let's say he withdraws it. What does he have? I'm he could end sure up with more if, charges. Uh, he could end up with more severity. I'm not sure if Michael Flynn's allies, I'm sure they think that he's, that they're trying to help him, but I'm not sure that's actually the practical, out, practical outcome. Well. And I think a lot of this, I saw some things from his siblings who were pushing it. And, mm -hmm. you know, families want to do that. And yeah. like you say, allies want to do it. But, but his lawyers ought to be telling him, look, you, you, you got a good deal. Uh, you need to continue to cooperate mm -hmm. and, and, and move this thing and put it behind you. Otherwise, you could face a, a, a much worse Something day when worse. it comes time for sentencing. Right. All right. Michael Moore and Tom Dupre, I'm so glad you were here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.
An Olympic record in perseverance highlights the American results from Pyeongchang. The team of Keegan Randall and Jesse Diggins claim gold in women's team sprint, the first U.S. women to claim any medal in cross-country skiing. It was especially sweet for Randall, the only mom on the American team, who set the Olympic record by winning her first ever medal in her 18th event over five different games. Meanwhile, Lindsey Vaughn, the most decorated American female skier ever, claimed bronze in the downhill, her signature event. Their medals helped propel the U.S. into a tie for fourth place with 16 medals overall in Pyeongchang so far. The war in Syria escalating as Russian-backed forces try to retake the last rebel-held areas. Hundreds of people are dead, many of them children, and a human rights group is blaming the Syrian government. Plus, the U.S. military could have a recruiting problem when a new report says about America's youth and their ability to serve their country.